Welcome to Free Thoughts. I'm Trevor Burris. And I'm Aaron Powell. Joining us today is Robbie Sauve, an associate editor at Reason Magazine and author of the new book, Panic Attack, Young Radicals in the Age of Trump. Welcome to Free Thoughts. Thank you for having me. We've had you on before to talk about these kids today, which is Aaron's favorite subject. Uh, although we're, we're past millennials now, Aaron. We're, we're at Zillennials. Gen Z. Gen Z, I don't, yeah. I don't know anything about that. Okay. All right. So, so are we really seeing something new? Uh, and actually, more specifically, even with Zennials, I think last time you were on, we hadn't even coined that term. So we're seeing not a real new. term. We, we, he made it. It's in the book. <laughs> it's well to to uh, to explain all of that. So yeah, millennials were the the previous young generation, people born between you know eighty and two thousand, roughly. Some people draw that more narrowly, or no one no one goes more broadly than that. But eighty to two thousand. Uh, next is Gen uh, Gen Z. Um, to get the combination of the two groups, I call them zillennials when we're talking about both. Um, zennials would technically be Gen X and millennials. So that's, that's the terminology, um, uh, clarification. And I'm, I try to be careful about drawing broad characterizations about entire generations. You know, generational trend stuff is always a little suspect in my view. Except for baby boomers. We can throw them under the They're bus. They're horrible, yeah, right? We can throw them All, under the bus as much as possible. Yeah. So what, what I have noticed and what I write about in the book is um, the most militant and activist wing of the young generation uh, who are active particularly on college campuses, but also on social media, are going to go on to occupy interesting places in media companies, private businesses, and who have um, uh, developed very hostile ideas to the concept of free expression, to things that, that progressives and even progressive activists used to hold in high regard, their views towards these things have changed. Again, not the entire generation, not all young people are a problem, but uh, in places where very politically, ideologically active young people have some degree of power, you've seen uh, kind of uh, frightening and in some cases entertaining and frightening uh, challenges to liberal norms or classically liberal norms. You said these are the kids who are um, militant and activist, right? Are, but are we talking specifically the left, or is this is this a phenomenon limited to kids on the progressive left, or are there the militant and activists among the right too? Uh, certainly on the right as well. And in my book, I, I spend a whole chapter talking about the development of what I see as the kind of uh, identity politics. Co uh, coalition on the young right, which is the alt right, um, who are who are more horrifying even and ho hold horrible uh, uh, views on uh, race and nationalism, etc. Uh, who are responsible for um, a small, not a negligible, a small amount of violence, uh, but also tons of harassment online is is what I think has been their main. Uh, evil contribution. So I, I there that's and they didn't they didn't exist you know 15 years ago or they didn't know to find each other they didn't know how to join up because you didn't have social media. Social media has allowed um, small contingents of like minded people to find each other and uh, and make life miserable for a lot of people. It, it's always done, it's also done a lot of good. It's also allowed people to to find it, uh, uh, people who share their interests and communicate across you know vast geographical distances uh which is good um so i talk about uh i talk about the problem on the right as well and and also not it's not even just the you know the alt right is is a really awful fringe group but also you have seen just kind of normal conservative activism on campus tend toward a a uh a self victimization uh sort of a language of of we're the victims and 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 we're going to do whatever you know, they 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 want to annoy liberal people i'm sure you've heard the expression own the libs like it's this joking thing that all of conservative activism the only, the purpose of it on campuses is to trigger the left and make them really mad and get them really upset and this happens time and time again it's i mean the the epilogue of my book is called when extremes meet because it truly is this feeding off each other this sort of they need each other um in some of these most uh most polarized environments like campuses social media etc like peter pan and captain hook they they need each other in some way or Very any, much. any sort of misery. and they won't grow up or bad. yeah exactly uh so is there a first mover in this i mean so you point out that obviously trump's election caused a bunch of things to happen and maybe 
move this along further. So can we say like the left moved first and then the right reacted or is it just sort of – or is the right is a manifestation – Trump is a manifestation of these bad tendencies on the right and then the left came in or – And just to add to that question, what's the timeline look like? Like is this something that it – it wasn't there. The, the kind of behavior and the kind of attitude you're about like didn't exist and then the millennials hit college and suddenly boom, there it all was or has it been emerging slowly over time even into you know prior generations? So it's, it's hard to say who struck first. It's like a, it's a feud between families or somewhere. Each has their own narrative for how they did nothing wrong and it was the, the neighbors who made off with the, the flock or something. I don't, I don't, I don't know what the, <laughs> the hat, whatever the I'm going with this. Fields and McCoy. Exactly. It's a flock. It's a sheep. It's something. Yeah. Um, but. It is true, however, that so so many of the kind of incidents I'm writing about in the book, things we've seen on campuses with with invited speakers being shut down or even greeted with violence, their uh, professors being in uh, being investigated at the behest of their students, the liberal professor. I mean, this is something happening to very far left professors who have said something in class that is somehow out of step with what young people think about maybe race or gender, and you'll have you know you could snap your fingers and someone will complain and the professor, even if they have uh, tenure, academic freedom, et cetera, can be in trouble. This is a phenomenon we definitely started seeing happening more often uh, in, I would say, 2013-ish. 2013, 2014. You know, so I graduated from the University of Michigan in 2010, um, and you know, part of the reason I wanted to write this book is because I, in, in reporting on campus issues for reason for the last few years, what I saw was just night and day from what I had seen during my own experience on campus, uh, working for the student paper, where you know I was working with very, very, very liberal, very progressive people. Uh, who would not have questioned at all their commitment to kind of ACLU type liberal principles, free speech, due process, et cetera? Uh, you know, they, the most outrageous or offensive person, it would be absolute without question, their right to speak on campus would be supported, uh, and that just started that started changing or being challenged uh, a little bit. Um, on cam uh, uh, the, the more elite campuses are more susceptible even to this. Um, uh, Harvard has uh, recently just fallen down, just unconditionally surrendered to a group of activist students who wanted a a, a famous and well-known liberal law professor. Uh, uh, they wanted him gotten rid of because he had agreed to represent um, Harvey Weinstein, who's accused of sexual harassment. They said, you doing that make has made this campus an unsafe place for women. Harvard Agreed, and they removed him not as a law professor, but as a dean of the faculty college. Um, so that kind of thing uh, we started seeing more often in 2013. When I've seen these stories, one of the things that I wonder about in terms of the emergence of this is often what you see are kids acting the way that kids sometimes do, and college students are still pretty young, um, and so. I have children of my own. They Kids are always pushing boundaries. They're always acting out. They're always making demands. It's just like what we do until – I mean I guess adults still do the same thing too but part of the maturing process. Um, and, and so whether this is a change in the way that college students are acting or the attitudes they have versus a way that the administration is responding to them, that, that if you, you – know, you criticize a professor. You get upset. Some professor says something you don't like, and that happens all the time, right? And so maybe in the past, you you send a complaint and it just gets ignored. But now, if the administration is like, "Oh, right, we're gonna we're gonna investigate that," then you've got a taste for it, and other people do it. And so, does has there been a change in the way that administration treats this behavior such that it's either encouraging or not clamping down on it? Uh, we, we, yes, um, perhaps predominantly because I mean the number of administrators that there are has grown so tremendously over the last twenty years. Uh, you know, if you look at faculty salaries, they haven't really gone anywhere. They haven't hired tons new faculty members. The proportion of faculty members to students is, I think, roughly the same at most colleges. The number of administrators towards students has skyrocketed. These people are paid very well often. Uh, often they're the, you know, the top however many um, uh, public employees in any state are university administrators. Uh, there, you know, there can be 
like a hundred people making more than a hundred k sometimes in uh, in uh, administrative positions. So there's a lot more people whose job ostensibly is to give students what they want. And so the more of those people there are, I think the more likely their the demands the students are making are are going to be taken seriously. Um, but I do think the there's also been a qualitative change to some degree in the things students are demanding. Uh, student demands in in sort of previous generations activist movements were often anti-authoritarian in uh, in character. I, I mean, I write about this in the book, going back to Berkeley and the free speech movement, uh, which which you know loved the concept of free speech. That thought the administ that wanted to cast off the shackles the administration at Berkeley had imposed on who could speak on campus, um, and, and which were really which there were really ridiculous rules for who could speak on campus. And they they the liberal progressive student group went so far in 1963 as to invite a literal Nazi to campus, and they all dressed in Nazi regalia to promote the event. This is the liberal students doing this. I mean, can you imagine if anyone did this on a, a campus today, it would be, you would like have a national day of mourning. It would be like, you would close the campus down. But they wanted people to come um, and then refute, did, and, refute his ideas. And no, Right, right. And nobody heckled him. Nobody talked over him. They just, they politely laughed when he was done right, making his remarks and he went on his way. And like, so no one felt their safety was impacted by this at all. That's the difference now. The 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 culture around safety uh, has changed, and now so to do that would be, in the view of many activists, many young people, to just to invite this person would be uh, would be causing violence. That's how they would say it. And what they mean by that is emotional harm. If you disrupt someone's emotional well-being, it's like you've compromised their physical well-being. So that so an expansion of of. Uh, mental health or uh, comfort, mental comfort, having uh, being part a part a fundamental part of your safety that the administration is responsible for preventing any harm to that is is a huge trend that has occurred. Curious about the the scope of this. So sometimes um, you see these stories that something something will happen in the news, and there'll be a story about how there's all these racists on Twitter saying racist things in response to it. But then when you go look at it, it's someone has aggregated like. Three dozen tweets out of the hundreds of millions that are being sent, and um, and so it's just a hand. You can always find a handful of people saying god awful things, and so we have we have stories of the kind of stuff that you're describing happening. Um, but there's also there's a shockingly large number of four year colleges and universities in the U.S. Like I looked it up at it's one like point, over five hundred. Oh, it's over. It's like in the two thousand oh, plus so, range. Yeah, I guess a very sense. very large number. Um, I don't actually know how they physically like where they all are, <laughs> but. So is this is this something that we're seeing across that extraordinarily large number of universities or is it a handful of stories that um, – I mean I don't want to say it's like just like the finding the 12 racists on Twitter thing. But is it like concentrated so it's just a thing of like liberal arts universities which are a very small number of them or just a thing among the, the elite Ivies which are again a very small number? Like so if you're – is the average college student – what's the likely the average college student across the country is experiencing this sort of thing? Uh, right. It, it – Probably low. It does. It, the type of institution matters tremendously. You, you know, if we're talking about just community colleges, places like that, uh, the, the more likely the college is to be providing a vital job training service, I think the less likely these things are to be taking place. So the kinds of of, of colleges that are that are uh, that are cheaper, that you're getting some degree that you actually need to 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 better your economic station, uh, you have more focused students who don't have the time or the patience, uh, and some of the, many of them are older students as well, or people going back to to college. So you you don't uh, you aren't as likely to have a kind of activist climate of of young people engaged in the kind of antics um, I'm describing. So I, I'm. Careful always to to not describe this as a generational problem, or even a you know other people have said is there well is there a free speech crisis on college campuses? No, that's ridiculous. Sure, it depends how you're defining crisis. This is not this is certainly not a crisis by the by the if, if we were defining it such that this is always happening on every campus and free speech is dead. No, of course there are plenty of times people are invited onto campus, even offensive people, and they speak and the and the event goes off without a hitch. Um, so there is some analogy to the uh, like the six races on Twitter thing. I've written, I write about that sometimes. It, like the Little Mermaid one was my favorite, where people are ostensibly everyone is mad that uh, you cast a black actress to play a, the, a white character, the Little Mermaid. 
which is questionable even that, but and then it's trending on Twitter, and you're like, oh, it's trending on Twitter. There's so that many races, but then when you looked at it, no, it was literally five or six people in a planet of seven billion who who were racist and were upset about this. But it was trending. It was trending because there were Talking hundreds of thousands more criticizing that perspective. Um, so we do have to be uh, have to be careful about that. But also, you know, and if it was just college students, college students says stupid thing. You're right. We. We have, can overcover that, and it is being overcovered. And, and there's and, a long and, tradition of that. It, it has a long tradition, but it's being covered more, uh, uh, more regularly now by national news media. I mean, in part because these things live on social media. You know, it, like a dumb newspaper column twenty years ago would not have would not have survived. It wouldn't have stuck around. It would have been gone the next day. Now, because it's online, you know, you could have cable news making fun of that, you know, for days to come. So there is a little bit of that. That said. There has been some violence too. I mean, even like it is, it's it's noteworthy when when students are like literally attacking people uh, because they don't want to hear them speak, uh, which has happened a couple times. Or I, I mean, the chilling effect on the faculty. I mean, faculty are who who should have the most you know norms of free speech. They should be able to broach any controversial subject without fear of reprisal. That's the environment I want them to operate in. You know, they tell me privately, you know, very few of them make public stance because they're that afraid. But they are they say they're terrified of their students, um, not all their students. They're just the, the one. There's going to be one in a class who's going to make their life a living hell if they say the wrong thing. And that that is a that like, again, I won't say crisis, but that is a problem. And it's more of a problem now. Yeah, it hurts education. I, I think we, we've law schools. We've seen it. Uh, I guess a trend of not teaching rape in criminal law anymore, which is a very valuable teaching tool and something you should has traditionally been taught. And we both went to law school, and it helps you learn the ins and outs of criminal law. But a lot of people are like, I'm not even going to touch it. So now we're hurting their educations because you're chilling the professors, and and most of them are probably liberal. They probably pass many of the tests of being woke enough. But of course, you bring up another thing that comes into play here, which you have really almost your first chapter on is intersectionality. So there's actually uh, for the left, and we'll we'll talk more about the right in a second, but there's actually an ideological framework around what they're saying. It's not just, oh, you really hurt my feelings and therefore I'm going to shut you down. It it actually has a lot, a little bit more behind it in terms of the claims that they're making. So what is intersectionality first to begin with? Sure. Intersectionality is a concept uh, that was coined in the late 1980s by a sociologist, Kimberly Crenshaw, who needed a, a term to describe uh, her her – uh, realization that you can be oppressed uh, for different reasons. Uh, if you're a black person, historically black people have suffered racism, so that's a source of oppression for for the marginalized for the marginalized category of people of color. Uh, if you're a woman, uh, sexism is the is the source of marginalization that has worked against your group, and so on and so forth. LGBT status, uh, age, disability status, economic status. So these are all distinct. Um, but they can they can stack if you're you know if you're a if you're a transgender gay black person then you have many sources of historical oppression that have impacted your group. Um, so that was that was just her her observation that these things are different but they related and they stack. That seems like fairly banal. Yes, it's right. It's it's sort of true, like trivially true. Like it's yes, that makes sense. Um, so there's nothing wrong with the theory. The activist community has really taken up the word um, over the last few years um, and seen it not just as a, a true philosophy but also as prescribing and Kimberly Crenshaw never talked about any of this, but also that it must prescribe a certain set of activist tactics that the most marginalized person uh, has the most authority to address issues of marginalization that that we should uh, we should defer to the marginalized on issues relating to their marginalization, um, but also we should not expect them to to uh, put themselves in harm's way because they're going to be the the people most affected by being harmed by virtue of being marginalized. So we can't. So we also can't expect them to lead the charge, but only they can lead the charge, and we can't ask them because it's not their job to educate us. It's our job to be educated. But if you're not already educated, there's no way to gain this knowledge because only they have it. But you have to talk to them. Yes. And yeah. The and also we, we you know it's not just race and gender and sex and sexual orientation but everything you can think of and in fact there are administrative bureaucracies on campus that are adjudicating that have whole lists of things that you know I'm, I'm not 
obviously you you can be oppressed or you can suffer slight for 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 and numerous reasons but all of a sudden it's like unless you agree with with the sort of leftist activist people on all of these issues including like what new pronouns should be used and, and, like, I have, and, and global a, warming too right I right mean, like climate change is, right. is is in the list and yeah. like everything so unless you agree on everything they're you're dead to us you, they don't want to work with you um and also the most so what do you do if you're a progressive white dude uh, who wants to like be involved in the activist community but you're not marginalized at all so the category that is easiest to exaggerate or to claim to be some member of is mental health because it has no it, it not like race or gender or something where you, objective you can, component or, right, or, or less objective which is I so I strongly suspect that is part of the reason we've seen so many more young people young activists progressive people talking openly about their mental health and that they have PTSD and that they're triggered and that you can't say anything in class that would offend them because you will compromise their safety. That is a that it's like a power move. That's saying yes, I am so committed and I am so progressive that it is it is killing me to to hold these ideas and that and 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 that's how I should have power in this group. What you've described, it's how we how we deal with that because the underlying the underlying motivation. So the intersectionality, as you. The, the initial way the term was used makes perfect sense um, and seems totally reasonable. And and then a lot of these concerns, like it does seem to be the case that you know if if you've had personal experience with something that that I have not, then you have something you have access to certain kinds of knowledge that I don't, and your experience is is meaningful in certain ways. And so it would make sense, especially if I'm making decisions about that are going to impact you, that your perspectives are present, and that if if you're if you're part of a marginalized group, then traditionally your perspectives have been kind of kept out of the situation, out of the conversations. And so we ought to make an effort to include them. Like all of these things seem perfectly reasonable, um, and. And even like the mental health, like it might be that the mental health, yes, there can be people exaggerating, but also mental health has been something that is traditionally it's not okay to talk about, it's not okay to admit, um, especially like among men that you know men are mm -hmm. supposed to be strong and stoic and not have these emotions and whatever, um, and so there's there's like a level of truth to that, and and it's it's good if we can be more open about this sort of stuff. And so how do you because the the tendency, especially this is the way that like conservatives in America when they see this stuff reported on Fox News talk about it is that all of this is just junk and that anyone who is doing this is just trying to, you know, in their own way like oppress the white male or um, undermine socialism. Western values or pass right. socialism. Um, but this seems to fit too with like when people – when when something's been – when a certain – you know, when we embrace a new set of values, we're often – like the recent convert, even if they're converted to a good set of ideas, is usually the most zealous, mm -hmm. right? And then they, after time of wrestling with it, tone it down. So how do you walk that line? How do you discuss this and identify the problems with it without at the same time falling into the trap of saying like it's all junk and – Everything about it is bad. Yeah, I mean, it's a very difficult line to walk. Uh, in that, there's, I, I think I'm one of very few people walking it, right? Because a lot of uh, critics of the, the the things I'm also criticizing, you're exactly right, taking in that go way too far um, and are just trying to, you know, they're, they're objecting to these things because, but they have their own sort of conservative uh, uh, social views that they want to force on everyone. Um, so it's it's not that they don't object to the forcing of views, <laughs> they just don't like the views. Um, and uh, you can, you know, you can whip people up to be afraid that there's more of these young people than there actually are. Um, but I do, uh, but I do think some of it so the right some of the things that are that are that are true yes we should listen to groups that have historically been oppressed that we we've not listened to but the intersectional activist is saying that the reason this person has value is because they belong to this group not because they might have been oppressed or something it, it's not a it's not an individualist ethos which is what um concerns me and also uh, and yes we should it's great that we've destigmatized mental health and that people who need uh Treatment are able are 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 able to get it and and are asking for it and being proactive about it. But there is there is a level of openness to talking about mental health on campus that that seems uh, 
unhealthy to me. I, I visited uh, Arizona State University for some research for this book. It's the most beautiful campus on earth. It's a very happy place. And every couple feet, there's a sign like saying, have you remembered to breathe today? You should visit the mental health facility. Like there's there's a level of like there must be something wrong with you. It's life is so hard. And you're you, are you sure you, you something must be going on? That's like you're going to convince or maybe incentivize people to think there's something wrong with them when there's not uh, that I, I actually do think is going on uh, a little bit. I, I interviewed a professor. It's one of the probably most entertaining anecdotes in the book. Um, who talks about, you know, she's a professor of, of theater, of acting at a liberal arts college, and she's, she's very left of center. And she said every single student in her class, her very privileged, mostly white students, claimed at some point to be suffering from PTSD, and it was derailing the entire class. That any feedback she gave them, uh, they said, no, you're triggering my PTSD. This is acting class. This is this acting is... class. So she was saying, and then, so there was no way to do it. Like, if you were having men play women roles, that was triggering. But if you were having men play men roles, that was triggering for playing into the, like, there was no way to satisfy 18 conflicting, competing uh, desire. And they all thought that it was totally their prerogative to contact her at any time and talk to her about the their mental health problem, any grade, any feedback she gave them. Like, this is, this is, and this is not the first time I've heard this from a professor of acting specifically. So, uh, so there is something going on. Uh, yes. Does that make easy outrage bait for right of center media and people? Yes. So it is hard to, you know, I also, I also try to, the way I, I try to distance myself from them is to then also criticize, um, the conservative groups and the conservative students who, you know, they'll write an art, they'll, or they'll take a video of their professor saying something un American. How dare they? And then, you know, there's a couple media sites that will run it and say, oh, professor, you know, says flag is bad. How dare they? And, and uh, I, so I try to make fun of that uh, too, which is equally absurd. I don't like the term, but I guess that means snowflakes all around. But, yes. But you know, it's interesting because we don't want to diminish mental health, but as you pointed out earlier, there's some incentive to claim it. And the Jonathan Haidt and Greg Lukianoff point this off in, in Connolly of the American Mind that trauma used to mean related to physical violence. So, so Soldiers who had their legs blown off had PTSD, and it's been continually defined broader and like down. So, so no physical harm needed, and then broader things that can give you trauma, and that gives them a lot of weapons in this situation. But even in that, it also seems like they're claiming this strange status. And, and Andrew Sullivan wrote a thing a couple of years ago because it was is intersectionality a religion, and he made some interesting points there. Where it, it doesn't have to be. So maybe the line that Aaron asked about, it doesn't have to be a religion. It can be an interesting critical point that you should be considering. Uh, but in some of the things in terms of being pure, having original sin, having heresies, having the kind of like witches that are in the area. You have a chapter called Burn the Witch, but like witches, witches are bad because they – people can hear them and then they can change thoughts in their mind and they can turn them away from the true faith. And that's like the problem with Charles Murray is that people might hear him and then turn away from this. So there are aspects of this maybe in an increasingly non-religious or, or irreligious society that these are – saving them in some sense, or they're saving the world through these kind well, of things, extreme the, versions of these theories. Yes. They I, they talk about the importance of belief. Uh, it, it, you have to believe people when they say they're victims of something. You you must believe them in, on a, in a, in a, a quasi-religious uh, way. Um, they t like they're the kind of activists I'm criticizing are very consciously sort of against um, facts and re reason, and it, well, they're they're sort of there's a subjectivity of it. That well, you, your idea of what is uh, is proving truth uh, is a sort of Western Enlightenment kind of uh, uh, thing that is that that was flawed and racist in its. Uh, we, we, and again, there are there are there are points that there are parts of this that that ring true. Uh, you know, people who have who have. Said we're going to just you know base everything on science and reason have 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 done have committed horrible atrocities so so it, it's not wrong to question I'm totally for questioning um, but they uh, but it, it does have this uh, quasi uh, religious category and also the the, the 
confession, you know, what's wrong, you have to confess what's wrong with you, and that that's what gives you sort of power and some right to be part of our circle, like an initiation. Like if there's, if, if you're, tr- if you were truly one of us, you would be suffering from PTSD is it, sort of, because you sort would of see thinking. how bad the world right, is, right. and you it would, would be, make you very upset yeah. to the point of trauma. And, and one of their, you know, one of their most common demands that has gotten a lot of publicity, for instance, is trigger warnings, uh, mandatory trigger warnings. They wanted their professors to have to warn them before they were going to encounter material in class that would trigger their PTSD. Of course, that doesn't really make much sense because, you know, what, what triggers in act, for actual PTSD, what triggers it is not always like talking about the exact, exact thing. Same thing yeah. it's, it's a smell or a sound or something that calls to, you know, some, that you couldn't warn someone because you wouldn't know exactly what it is. But also, I've been glad now to see finally another study. I think there's a third or fourth study has come out just a few weeks ago finding that uh, trigger warnings do no good and if anything may do harm even for people who suffer from uh from some form of trauma uh because you're preparing them to be you're you're telling them that like this is going to scare you and then it heightens their anxiety and then the thing is not not actually so scary so there have now have been so many studies showing that this concept has really no value i i actually think it might be fading or starting to fade there there was a a writer at slate had a headline recently saying Okay, I'm finally changed my mind about trigger warnings. I'm like, great, good. We need more people to do this. You said that you saw this really taking off in 2014, mm-hmm. thereabouts. So we're half a decade in, which is not long. Um, and we had we had the the a PC bubble in the 90s. Like um, then there were books like Politically Incorrect Bedtime Stories. It was a bestseller, you know, making fun of this, and it it blew like that PC bubble blew over. Right. Um, so is this a bubble or a fad? Like everyone – like every kid goes through a goth stage but that doesn't mean that like they went through the goth stage and now as like a 40-year-old middle manager somewhere, they're still gothing it up, right? Um, is, this a, is this a phase that is going to blow over or these kids are going to outgrow it or do you see this as something that they will take with them and continue throughout their life and as they get into positions of authority themselves or – into places where they have more influence, this stuff is going to have pernicious effects that reach outside of just some speakers yelled at on campus. I think it will continue to have very pernicious effects uh, even if it is a bit of a fad and even if uh, the the numbers of young people engaged in these kinds of things is not increasing or even is decreasing because it only takes a few and it has it has truly only been a few at these colleges even at the even at Oberlin or Reed or your your most insane university it's still going to be a handful of young people who are majoring in uh, a, a sociology or or a, a a critical studies kind of class or, or a, a activist studies kind Kind of class uh, who have been who have been filing complaints or staging protests or in some cases engaged in violence. Um, very few people, and they have changed. They have had a substantial effect on campus culture with the changing of of uh, with Title IX, for instance, which is is the uh, the statute relating to uh, to sex and gender discrimination that was has been used by them to to suppress. Uh, all sorts of speech by other students and by professors that it, is, it some has something to do with sex or gender. So my concern is you just hire a couple of those people uh, and some of them will get jobs and they will weaponize the sort of laws or or policies against harassment in the exact same way and even if it's a even if it's a even if it's one percent of of these kinds of of uh, people, there will still be compliance. There will still be a fear of them. There has been a fear of them, even though, the, again, they're this super minority. There will be, you know, you will see things like, uh, I'm very concerned about things like uh, James Damore, the guy who who uh, was fired by Google uh, for for an internal note um, uh, criticizing some of their, their policies. But and he was it, trying to it, rock the boat. I mean, it'd be hard to work with him for some people after that. Um, and they can fire whoever they want. That's true. Um, but the issue is they feel they have to fire him because he's made the place an unsafe workplace oh, well, environment. Is, that That's the concern. The law, That's yeah. why Kevin Williamson cannot work at the Atlantic. It was not even that it was not I mean, they hired him in the first place, so it was not that he holds views we we don't want him to publish, uh, which would be fine. They can fire him again, like for any reason. He was fired because there was someone at the Atlantic 
uh, who felt it was going to be a hostile workplace environment to employ someone who had this view. Which is Sup that Supreme is, Court employment law right, language. Yes. That is the concerning aspect of this to me. Or th those people are going to work at places like Facebook and Twitter and are going to be setting policies for what kind of speech is permitted. And again, I so I completely support the company's rights to ban whoever they want, but they're going to be setting these policies because of administrative com uh, compliance or fear of getting themselves in legal trouble or or, or bad publicity or something for uh, these kinds of the, the super woke minority. And I think that is concerning. You mentioned Oberlin, and that's where this recent case with the bakery thing yeah. is, right? Yeah. Um, and so is that. Is that a possible way that we start to see pushback on it? So in this this case, the students decided that a bakery was irredeemably racist um, and started boycotting it and the administration, it looks like, got involved in supporting this and the bakery owner sued and won a very large settlement. Is that what it's going to take? Like, Do you think that that will change things at Oberlin? Not, not necessarily in the way that the students act but in the way that the faculty and the administration – supports or condones or at least looks the other way on this yeah, stuff? I, I, act, I even actually had some reservations about that case. Uh, David French, who writes about uh, a, a lot of these same things, uh, is a conservative writer for National Review. Um, you know, he was thrilled about this verdict and, and thought, yeah, this is this this is the way forward. A, a civil suit when these kinds of things happen and, and showing real damages and having that kind of remedy rather than a legislative remedy. And so, so it's good that it's not a legislative remedy or a, a top down kind of thing. I still didn't quite necessarily agree after I looked closely at the facts of it that the administration had um, had materially contributed to the antics of the students um, or, or had or – because the claim was that they had defamed the bakery by saying that the bakery was racist or had been racially profiling. But that was on the students and they – again, they sued the university and the university had maybe handed a flyer to someone. It, it was a little – it was dicier for me who you – know, I'm an ardent pro-free speech person. I think they're, they're, the things they said about the bakery were wrong and were vile and were horrible. Did I, you know? But I, I'm also I'm concerned about libel being too broad and defamation being too broad. So I, I didn't love that. And that I, one. it was such a big verdict. I expect it will probably be cut in half by the appellate court. We'll, that we'll would be see. more reasonable. Yeah. Um, you know, so the best way to, I, I think, to deprive um, the kinds of activists I'm criticizing of some of their power is to challenge them uh, when it occurs. The answer to bad speech is more speech, not to suppress speech. Um, I want faculty to to criticize. You know, leftist faculty should criticize these kids, and they should feel supported for doing so. That they will not be in danger from their administrators. That they will not be investigated or suffer retaliation. Uh, those are the, those are the changes that need to be made. Uh, so that because when these students are challenged by by professors, by administrators, by other students. Uh, often by it, – it's I, I've seen it when you know they're trying to shout down Charles Murray and someone stands up and says, well, I'm a minority student, but I would like to hear what Charles Murray has to say. It robs them of their – because their power is only situational. They, if, they, if they've lost the room or they, they, they melt away. Um, so, so just more – so more of that kind of thing is well, what I want to see. We saw that at Reed – I think it was Reed College where there was the story about the – some big classics class that they had that mm -hmm. was constantly being berated by some of the super woke. And so the students had created their own little private Facebook group to like talk about these things on the side and it was, it was hugely popular. And, and yeah. so, because that's the other <laughs> thing too is you, there's got to be a bunch of students out there, as you pointed out, who are not super woke. They, they, they want to talk about these ideas. They think maybe exactly like we all are, like intersectionality is interesting. We should talk about it. Uh, we shouldn't pillory people if they don't agree with every single thing I say, but they're not allowed to. And maybe they're creating like secret chat rooms and groups and stuff like that to go forward and then maybe they'll stand up and, and take them down. Well, similarly, do we – have we seen or do you expect to see more I guess, sorting in the marketplace addressing this that like – if if your university gets the reputation for being the kind of place where this happens, then students who are into that sort of stuff, into those viewpoints are going to go there in the same way that like religious – small religious schools tend to attract people who are on board with the ideology at the core of it. And we don't really have much of a problem with small religious schools because they can do these things in their own space and that's fine. The problem here is is 
the universities forcing these viewpoints or the students using the universities to force these viewpoints. Right. Well, that's the irony too because like the small like conservative groups, they're the ones who originally pioneered like regulating the sexual lives of their students, right. right? In some specific way, like no girls in the dorm after five or, you know, relationships have to be reported or whatever. And that's of course what a lot of the world right. want to do too. But are right. we seeing – Applications go down at universities that have a reputation for this or students who want a different kind of education simply choosing to go somewhere else? Um, the universities that allowed some of the uh, or, or, or played host to some of the most um, insane uh, 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 outbreaks, for lack of a better word, uh, like Mizzou and Evergreen, took massive enrollment hits, uh, massive financial hits um, for, for, for doing so. Uh, so there is that. Donors have punished uh, universities where this has happened. Um, so, so certainly that's uh, uh, one means of, of combating this. Um, yeah, do, I, I counsel donors to universities to be very careful uh, and how where how their money is being spent. This uh, Hill, Hillsdale and and uh, Mizzou are right now engaged in this most fascinating. It's a little tangential to the book, but no, it, is it, it's, it is fascinating. Lawsuit. Yes, yeah. I absolutely think uh, Mizzou is wrong and should lose uh, this grant. It, they, it was a grant to hire these uh, Austrian Mises style economists. It's farcical that they absolutely did not do so. These people have no idea who von Mises is. They, wrote, they signed a letter, and though. they signed a letter. They, they, like this is a huge academic integrity issue too. They signed a letter saying they were. They are not. If they say they are, they are liars because they are clearly not. So uh, anyway, that's a tangential, yeah, and then, and, very and, interesting. And, and the grant, if if it doesn't go to Austrian economists, then it goes to Hillsdale. Right. Like in the event that Mizzou doesn't actually do this, it goes to Hillsdale. But I guess the, the broader question then is like, are we okay with an educational landscape where there simply is kind of more sorting for ideology? So as opposed to all of the universities, every university going back to enforcing like strict standards of free speech. We just have more universities that have – Well, public universities need to. Sure. OK. But but a lot of these are private universities that we're talking about too uh, where they just have – they're like, we've got our own kind of ideology and this is what you're going to get on campus and if you like it, you like it and if you don't, there's plenty of other places for you to go. Is that an OK – Solution woke, to this woke you versus unwoke you. That would not be my favorite solution, honestly. Um, I mean, that would be fine. That would be again, again, private organizations can do what they want. You want to start a campus, and and you, if you want to be explicit and say these are our rules here, give us your money and come here, and the person says, okay, I will give you my money and come here. Then that's fine. I mean, and that is what religious schools do. They say there will be these restrictions. You will show up for mass on this day. Give us your money, and uh, and it's you know, and it's a contract because you're you're paying them. Um, it's not to me. It's different than like social media where the, you're not even paying for a service, so you really have no right to complain. Like if they just arbitrarily ban you, oh well. Yeah. You know, you didn't. You're not paying for this. You are paying for the university education. Um, so they should be. They should honor what they what they the norms and policies and procedures that they are guaranteed. You, you will have in their agreement with you, and which all the many, most, many, if not most of the universities I'm talking about make explicit free speech and due process guarantees to the students. So they should, they're absolutely required to extend those. I, you know, I want. I want campuses where you can have uncomfortable conversations, where you can disagree, where you can dissent from the campus point of view, the professor's point of view, other students, and you can hash out those things. I think that's what makes for a more interesting university experience. I mean, as a young libertarian at the University of Michigan, I had a, a great experience hearing all sorts of perspectives that are at odds with mine, many of which I, I – furiously disagreed with and continue to this day, some of which I might have seen some some merit in. You know, I remember like the first uh, interesting person I got to interview while working for the campus paper was uh, Bill Ayers, the Weather Underground guy had camp come to campus. And it was so cool for me, you know, a young person deciding they want to be a journalist. And I got to interview this famous person about college activism and what he had to say was interesting. And like that was a really cool formative experience for me that, you know, would have been denied under like, because, uh, well, he he actually is a, he's, he poses no threat to anyone now, but he ha had been engaged in At actually some explicit yes. <laughs> property destruction uh, that certainly a, a conservative authorities uh, you could easily see saying no we, this this makes campus unsafe he can't be there uh, using the exact same kind of language so that that's the kind of thing I'm very much against. It seems to me you now you follow this stuff very very closely, but it seems to me that there's less of these crazy stories, fewer of these crazy stories than there were. 
2015, 16, 17. I mean, it's like gone down a little bit. Um, is that true or, or in, in general, or does it, is it optimism you have or, or you kind of measured optimism or what uh, do you see in the future? I think it's true. Um, to some extent, I mean, and many of the you know many of the the shutdowns that were occurring of outside speakers specifically were occurring because of just a handful of speakers: Milo Yiannopoulos, uh, Ben Shapiro, Christina Hoff Summers, Charles Murray, Heather McDonald uh, were on campus speaking tours, and now those tours just aren't happening, or those people weren't those five people <laughs> weren't interested in doing it anymore. Uh, Milo is is sort of out of the public eye. Uh, for the good. Um, and so those kinds of things uh, are, are happening less frequently. I don't know that the professors self-censoring because of fear of their students is any le- is happening any less. No, those things don't always make their way into headlines. Um, so it's hard to quantify that type of thing. Uh, also, we've been in a, in a political sort of so the election stuff is going to start start up soon. Election kind of stuff uh, uh, sets everyone on edge. Will make campuses more radical, hotbeds of freak out sort of political protest stuff. So I, I would expect more in the coming year to kind of match the the what we saw in 2015, 2016, perhaps. Thank you for listening. If you enjoy Free Thoughts, rate and review us on Apple Podcasts or in your favorite podcast app. Free Thoughts is produced by Tess Terrible and Landry Ayers. To learn more, visit us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.